to this. I'm going to go and sit on the water line and look at the coast and maybe meditate and maybe the bugs will leave me alone like they do in the Zen stories. Right, they did right. not leave me alone. But uh, a bear did come by and I was like, wait a minute, what's that? And I Welcome to the Transformations Podcast. Here, guests and I will share our transformative experiences and we'll explore how to find excellence in life. So we are here today. The Transformations with the amazing and delightful Lori O'Connell, who is an outdoors person. <laughs> among crazy, other things. <laughs> among other things, a crazy ice bath lady, uh, a martial arts extraordinaire and an author. Welcome, Lori. Thank you. Mm, it's good to be here. Thanks for inviting me. Yeah. So I'm super excited to talk to you because... Uh, you are, your shirt says Canada. I just read cannabis. Well, so I just typed this Stunts Canada. It's a uh, Stunts Canada. There it is. And um, there's so much going on with your life and, and with your things. And, and when people like me just get a glimpse in through Facebook, it's like every time you put up stuff, it's like all these great adventures. So I'd like to kind of talk to you a little bit about that and, and get, get some of the feedback on, on your experiences with different things. So where, where did you grow up? I grew up here actually in Ottawa and uh, lived, uh, grew, grew up here till I was 21. And then I moved to Japan for three years. Then I moved to Vancouver and spent 22 years. And now full circle came back here last year. Nice. Why did you move to Japan? Uh, that was because of my interest in the martial arts as well as the mm -hmm. culture of Japan. Uh, I wanted to go there and experience it for myself uh, in the place that it was all from. Right. And, and I also was teaching English while I was there. Oh, you were? Okay. Yeah. And what part of Japan were you in? I was in Fukushima Prefecture and a city called Iwaki. Mm -hmm. uh, I lived in Tokyo for a bit. Uh, so I lived around the corner, a couple blocks from the Kodokan, where Jigoro Kano set up his big judo school. Very cool. Uh, yeah. It's probably 94, 90, or 95, 6, somewhere in there. Uh, what year were you over there? What years? I was there from 2000 to 2003. Mm, nice. Did you learn Japanese while you were there? Or yeah, you were I did. I did. But that's so it's so dated now. It, I I can speak a little of it, but it you know when you don't practice it, it just goes away kind oh, of. No. <laughs> Same for me. Same for me. Did you study jujitsu over there? Because I know that's your martial art of choice. Well, they didn't have it in the city where I lived. Um, I did study some Aikido for a little while, but honestly, it was a little bit xenophobic. We're in the small town that I was at. Yeah. So I ended up, uh, after eight months of trying, I was just like, you know what? This is just not a good environment for me. I actually had started teaching jujitsu at a, at the local community center while I was there to uh, a number of foreigners, as well as a few very adventurous Japanese people who saw what I was doing and was very, uh, and were interested in what I had to offer. That's pretty cool. So, um, what what got you interested in studying martial arts? Well, uh, I first, I mean, my first foray into the martial arts would have been fencing, actually, Western fencing. I started that when I was 12 after doing, you know, seven or eight years of dance, different kinds of dance, because my mom put me into dance. And I, I always thought that that was like school. I just had to do it. And I never really enjoyed it and never really identified with it. And then when I was, you know, getting into my early teen years, uh, my dad said, you know, if you don't like it, why don't we look at a guide and a community guide and find it something that you're interested in? And I picked fencing. Nice. And uh, I tried that. And I really liked it. And I did it for a number of years competitively, um, uh, probably about seven years. Um, at the end of it, my fencing career in foil, I was I finished 26th in Canada for women's foil. And then it, there was, was a brief period in the university where I went back into it because some of the people I used to fence with wanted me on their on the fencing team in university. So I fenced Sabre and we we swept and won all the medals uh -huh. that year. So it was pretty cool amazing but fencing i kind of when i started to kind of my interest in the competitive side of of it was waning i i kind of wanted something that was more for personal development um when i was around 15 i looked into starting a martial art and i chose kenryu jiu-jitsu and i basically never stopped <laughs> <laughs> and and kenryu means like canada ryu the canadian yeah, can style canadian style yeah exactly uh -huh. what's the history of that who began that style uh, that was professor Sylvain who started it in the uh 
I think in the late 60s. He, wow. uh, you know, he started it based on his uh, different varying varieties of training that he had done, putting them all together to make um, a style of jujitsu that was designed to be effective and simple, but also considering the Canadian laws and temperament. Mm. Um, so the four principles of Kanryu are simplicity. So I'm trying to choose simple techniques that are effective and easy to learn. Um, using gross motor skills is the second principle. So it's techniques that uh, use larger muscle groups and are easier to learn more quickly. Um, commonality of techniques. So you're not reinventing the wheel when you do, say, like a left wrist grab or a right wrist grab or a cross wrist grab. It's all very similar depending on the context of the attack. And then lastly, um, awareness of other threats. So um, keeping in mind that, you know, there could be other attackers or other, you know, circumstances that could be uh, an impediment to one's safety while you're defending yourself. Mm. There's actually pretty a pretty good set of principles to work from, seeing as though most teachers focus on things like how many ways can I teach Kota Gaesh, you know, how many ways can I teach this wrist lock and eight, and they try and get very technical. And this is kind of like, Hey, you know, you're not, you're going to lose all your fine motor skills once the adrenaline starts pumping and the heart is racing. And and that's a hundred percent what he was all about. I mean, he yeah. devised a number of drills and activities to help simulate, uh, give or not simulate to actually adrenalize you and realize how that's going to affect your performance. So we had like this high stress sparring drills where we'd all be suited up. And I mean, it was like a, a striking exercise, but to, you know, realize how, how much more challenging it is when to deal with multiple attackers and the amount of adrenaline you have pumping to you and how much the technique goes out the window. It's, it was a pretty good exercise to do. Yeah. How fast you become winded. Uh, yes. And but, we, I actually did the, the, that uh, training with professor Sylvain directly. But this was back when I was in my early twenties and it was uh, eye opening. It was really interesting. Oh, cool. Just getting back to fencing for a minute. Like I'm sure just like here in the US, I mean, we have community centers and there's 30 different activities you could do. And a lot mm -hmm. of them can be competitive, you know, basketball, tennis, volleyball, soccer, wrestling, you know, why fencing? Like what, did you just have a night like you want to stab somebody or? <laughs> well, I've always been on the, well, I would never describe myself as a typical woman growing up. Um, yeah. I'm definitely on the uh, gender non-conforming side of things. Mm -hmm. And uh, after doing, you know, many years of dancing, I wanted to go in the complete opposite direction. I wanted something fighty and, you know, and visceral. And, uh, and that was the only one thing in there that uh, looked in, like something appealing. It's like, oh, I get to play with swords. Awesome. <laughs> right. Stab at people and be competitive. Nice. Mm -hmm. And then you, you continued that for quite yeah. a while. I mean, and then you moved into jujitsu and that's just been ongoing. Yeah. I mean, yeah. when yeah. did you, um, move out to Vancouver and start and open did you open your school right away or did did you do that after you met your husband uh that was 2003 um okay. I started it I moved it to Vancouver in 2003 I started the dojo in 2006 okay. Okay. um I ran that dojo for 14 years I met my husband through the dojo oh through the dojo yeah like okay. he he came into my dojo from another style of jujitsu he had a brown belt in that other style and there wasn't anyone operating that style in Vancouver at the time. Uh, so that's why he ended up training with me. And uh, he, at the time we, and I, he and I got together, we, he wasn't technically my student. He was just, uh, he was going in and out of town working for, uh, as a geophysic, uh, geophysical survey technician. But uh, when he was back in town, we, that's when we kind of got, to, got together. Yeah. So that's pretty cool. So, when you moved out to Vancouver, was it because you had a job offer or you just wanted to go to Vancouver and you were like, I have an entrepreneurial spirit and this is what I'm going to do? Well, I met my ex-husband in Japan and oh, okay. he, he and I were we decided to move to Vancouver. He was going there for an acting. He wanted to go there for acting and uh, study acting and to get involved in the film industry. Uh -huh. And I thought that sounded pretty cool anyway. And I'd mm -hmm. always been interested in the film industry sure. uh, stunts and I thought this would be a neat opportunity yeah. to get into that nice mm -hmm. when you opened your dojo did you start it in in a small like backyard community center ymca i don't know if they have ymcas in canada but oh they do they do um <laughs> but it was essentially something like that originally the first location was um there was a judo guy who was running like he just had an um an industrial space 
space that he was renting out to teach judo and he was renting the on the off days to other martial arts uh, instructors yeah and i was a i became one of the people offering a class in that space um that's where we started and man did we ever go through a lot of locations uh until we uh had uh, until we finally landed on a, a place where i was the uh, leaseholder mm -hmm. and that went pretty well for a long time i mean it seems like a decade or so right i it's mean 14 years 14 years yeah i know a lot of people had to close their schools and restaurants during covid is that is that something that you experienced as well that yes it was like just completely impractical to keep it running and obviously no one was running martial arts schools and I just and, and because film industry also wasn't running which is what I was doing for work I had no way to keep the do the doors open so we just right. as soon as we could got, could break get the, out of the lease we did yeah but it wasn't such a big deal because we'd always thought we were going to move back to Ottawa anyway and over the course of the pandemic we kind of thought well this is kind of making us want to do it even more because we, there was a couple of times where we were literally cut off from our families. We couldn't fly to see them. There was like a massive flood that, you know, completely shut down the Trans Canada highways uh, and trains. So, and then because we couldn't go through the state, there would have literally been no way we could get back to Ottawa if some emergency happened. And started making us reevaluate, you know, being so far from our families and. You know, we'd always th thought we would move back at some point. Um, we thought we would wait until we were closer to being done with our stunt careers. But then we just said, figured, you know what, let's see if we can continue the stunt careers in Ontario because there's there is a, an active stunt community in in Toronto, mm -hmm. not in Ottawa, but you know, it's not too hard for us to commute to right. Toronto when yeah. we have work. And yeah. and what are some of the films uh, or commercials or television that you've done stunts for? Well, the biggest one I did was uh, stunt doubling for the main mermaid character on Siren, which is on Disney Plus. Mm -hmm. um, and then I was also the stunt double for the main character on Haunting of Blind Manor. I did stunt doubled for the Queen a number of times on uh, Once Upon a Time. I could stunt doubled for character on DC's Legends of Tomorrow. There's, I, you know, honestly, I couldn't remember every single thing I've done, but the most recent stuff I've done, I, I was stunt doubling for Ritu Aria on playing Lila on uh, Umbrella Academy. Oh, that's a cool show. That's yeah, it's just for the last the, the last season of the show. Mm -hmm. And I did a little bit of a little stunt doubling work on Gen V. Um, mm -hmm. I don't know if it's come out yet. The my episode, it was, I think it was episode seven. I'm mm -hmm. not sure how far they've released them, but I know they've started releasing them. Nice. And you know that I reached out to you a, a year or so ago or more about doing some stunt work. And actually the film that I wrote is where we're just getting our financing from Malaysia. We're gonna shoot in, in Kuala Lumpur uh, mm. about a female assassin. And you look similar to her and you have all the skills. So I'll be reaching out to you again about that. <laughs> oh, that would be awesome. Yeah, uh... a lot of knife fighting. And I love that one uh, technique I see you do on YouTube where you jump up and spin around and take the person down. <laughs> Uh, got I've done that for a few different things now. I, yeah. A couple of them, I did it on, on uh, what did I do it on? I did it on a short film that was uh, on a run and gun competition back in Vancouver. Mm -hmm. the other? Oh, yeah. And of course, the short film that I made, uh, Inner Demon. That's when we guys had guns and stuff, right? No, that, no, no, no. Inner Demon. Oh, sorry, the, the guns one that was run the the one where I did the guns one that was for the run and gun competition. The oh, inner okay. demon was my short film that I wrote, produced, and performed in. Actually, I I shared it again recently, actually on Facebook. Uh, have you seen it? No, you share, have to share me the links and I'll put them into the into the pro, into the episode here. Yeah. I'm really proud of that work because like it's it's really. Yeah, uh, it was. It speaks to me as a martial artist, but also, mm -hmm. uh, but even though the martial arts in it is a meta, it's like a metaphor for the inner battles that everybody kind of goes through. So, you don't have to be a martial artist to appreciate it. But the method of delivering the uh, message is pretty much martial arts. <laughs> <laughs> That's always cool when martial arts can do that. I know that I yeah. lived through a lot of my struggles by being in a dojo somewhere and practicing and fantasizing too, you know, a lot about things with martial arts to help me get through things in life. Did you have struggles like that growing up or in your teen or adult years where martial arts really helped you get through them? 
the training. Well, no, I came into the martial arts very late uh, in uh, like when I was 15. And that's like, I was bullied pretty badly when I was in, when I was a child and uh, I didn't wrong. Well, not, it wasn't a physical bullying though. It was the teasing variety that right. women mostly go through. And, uh, but there was some, yeah, actually, no, there was one time when somebody, some kid was, was teasing me and, and uh, it was like, I was in middle school and he was saying that uh, my skin was the color of crap. And then I was like, get, you know, and I got all worked up and then I, well, this is before I took any martial arts and I kicked him in the ribs and he went to the principal to, to uh, crying to tell him about it. And, but it's funny that you know, when I did go to the principal and they told the story of what happened, they ended up calling his parents, but not mine. So yeah. yes, they thought it wasn't such a bad thing that I kicked him. So martial arts was in your blood early. <laughs> well at least there's there's a bit of a fighting spirit and i think that i did you know that that uh, that moment that i stood up for myself did fundamentally impact the way i looked at all of that and i think that's part of the reason why i, I kind of developed an interest in uh in martial arts and fighting arts of different types you do mm -hmm. a lot of things out in nature uh if someone looks at your facebook page it's full of camping and hiking and frozen lake uh, soaking, I don't know, what, uh, Wim Hof, uh, you know. When did you get interested in kind of being in nature a lot? Well, I I did have some, you know, exposure to camping when growing up. It was more like car camping with my parents and, you know, in a very comfortable trailer. Nice. It was more when I was in my late teen, early 20s that I started wanting to be a little more adventurous with it. Um, my very first backcountry camping trip was when I was 20 and I convinced my boyfriend that this would be a really fun thing to do. And uh, we'll do a week long canoe portage in Algonquin, one of Canada's national parks and do this big loop. It's 140 kilometers. I'd never done any backcountry camping before. And I thought this was a wonderful idea. And I did all this research and bought all the gear and said, okay, I'm going to plan it all out. And we're going to go to here, 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 here and loop around. And boy, was that a, a <laughs> really ill-conceived journey. Um, you know, there was a lot of setbacks and I would not suggest anyone do it that way ever <laughs> because, you know, if you've never gone backcountry camping, it's probably better to do an overnight or maybe two nights uh, and have an easy way to get in and out. Whereas we are doing a, a loop. So Anyway, we had some struggles where we were facing bad weather and we weren't able to you know, make as much progress and we get more and more behind on our trip. So well, we had to be out of the, the bush like after the week because that's what we were booked in there for. So if we didn't come out, people would start looking for us. Huh. And I also didn't pack enough food. I, I packed food like we were just going to be eating normally and exercising normally for a week. But because I made such an aggressive trip plan we ended up canoeing like you know more than six hours a day and uh, we just would go home go back to our tent we get settled into camp nightfall cook our quick meal and go to bed hungry every night because we didn't have enough food. <laughs> but let me tell you that we we did manage to make up the time we got a really good day of weather and so we were able to canoe for 10 hours straight to make up the distance that we didn't cover and mm -hmm. then at the end of the trip uh we got out right on time we drove home and on the first motel slash restaurant that we came across on our route home we stopped and got the biggest steak meal the <laughs> big pint of beer mashed potatoes everything and ate and ate and ate it was nice. awesome <laughs> that sounds amazing um, but then I, I didn't do it for a while after that. I mean, because I went to Japan soon after um, we didn't, I mean, I did a lot of hiking and uh, cycling and, you know, various kinds of adventures while I was in Japan, but I didn't do any backcountry camping until I moved to Vancouver. And then it wasn't even right away in Vancouver because I didn't have a car for so long. And for you to go to a lot of, a lot of those trails, you need to have a vehicle. So it wasn't until like, I'd say mid like 2012 20 or so that I started doing exploring backcountry camping in Vancouver area and uh started off doing you know some really fun like overnight backcountry camping trips where we basically go up a mountain and then you know um, you 
set up a camp and then go all the way up to the peak or whatever and then go back down and camp for the night and you know like these are pretty aggressive yeah hike you know like uh, nothing like you can get around here it's just they were just awesome and uh over time i got more and more interested i invested in better gear lighter gear because all my gear was like 20 years old at that point real heavy. so heavy and when you're carrying that heavy gear and going up a mountain it's brutal <laughs> So after I investigated some ultralight gear, I started doing, you know, some other um, and other types of trips. Like I, I started doing solo backcountry camping um, and carrying everything on my back with a much lighter pack. And um, I did the house on Crest Trail as my first one. And yeah. then eventually I that was just an overnight one because I'm sensible now and I choose overnight hikes for my first hikes and for first solo camping experiences. Yeah. Of course, that was a very, very challenging overnight hike, but uh, somehow I managed Most to do Most challenging it. about it. Uh, well, I mean, I'd read the description of it and it did say that it was a, you know, like a, a harder trail, but like I also read that many people trail run that trail. So I'm like, yeah. well, if people run it, how hard could it be? Right. But people uh, do some pretty, pretty crazy trails for trail running. So, yeah. um, and I figured also because I had cell reception for most of that journey, I was should, should be okay. Yeah. And uh, there were parts of it where I just couldn't find the trail to save my life because there was multiple markers and it was very unclear um, where I was supposed to go. And so I'd have to backtrack and try to figure out where I was. I also, because it was such a beautiful day, I got there really sidetracked by taking photos because just unbelievable pictures. I, I I put all this stuff up on my blog. I can send you the link if you want yeah, after. Please. But the mm -hmm. pictures and the the views and and then um, I just and then when I was starting to lose track of where I was on the because of the mismarking of the of the trail, I started getting behind more and more behind. And uh, I had to make it to the camp that where I was trying to get to by nightfall because that's where the water source was. There's no water source until I got to that. Wow. Uh, so if I didn't make it to that, and I was really dehydrated, you know, I, if I didn't make it to that, I wouldn't, I'd go the night without drinking any water and would have been not ideal. <laughs> I mean, I would have survived. I, I've had to do that in the past, but, but I really wanted to make it there. So, and so to do that, I ended up having to hike into the dusk and dark and to, and I made it there at like 10 to 9 at the time it was you know pretty much black at at night and there was nobody on the trail either it's not like I had other people around that I could ask for help or ask questions it was completely barren because I went on a Thursday so uh -huh. nobody was there and even <laughs> where I was camping it was completely barren it's just me in the campground wow See, I'd be in my tent at night thinking Freddy Krueger's come in and, you know. <laughs> uh, well, I was worried about more than, I was worried about the worried bears. About Krugers, uh, and bears. Maybe. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so I was like singing on the trail uh, and or playing music on my iPhone just to keep some noise going. Mm -hmm. I would think at this point they would have like GPS for trails, you know, like they have for roads. I didn't have that back then. Yeah. Um, they have, well, I have like Gaia, uh, which is a really good app uh, that I could yeah. use all the time now, mm -hmm. but they did, I didn't have that back then. Right. I also didn't have my, I have I'm since bought, invested in a, a satellite communicator. Um, mm -hmm. as, as, so I have that for when I'm doing solo packing, which is a lot safer. I mean, cause you don't know for sure what, it, you know, if you're, you know, you're going to have connections. And I also did the West coast trail. Mm -hmm. uh, and the North Coast Trail solo packed, uh, but, but neither of those have cell reception on them. So I definitely wanted to have that device for those. And those were like longer ones. So it's like I did the West Coast Trail in 75, it was a 75 kilometer trail I did in 71 hours. And then the West, the North Coast was 80 kilometers in, it was like 80, 80 kilometers or something like that in in like basically four days you know I was doing them very quickly moving fairly quickly I think I saw a documentary recently a YouTube documentary about a Japanese girl who got a big following because she started doing hiking uh she was a model or something I don't know if you're familiar and she got a big no. following she was doing all these amazing hikes and then she went on this massive one by herself and fell off a cliff like they found her whoa yeah. 
if I, if I, re, I it's probably in my watch thing on YouTube, I'll share you a link. Oh, because that's the stuff she was doing and she would take pictures, you know, fashion pictures, wherever on these peaks and stuff for her fans. And she had this big following. And then one time she said, I'm going to take this next hike by myself. And that was it. And, and there's that guy who was rock climbing. You know, his that's arm right. got caught in between the rocks and he got his pocket knife. And he had to cut his hand off. You're oh, right. I know that story. They made a movie about that. Yeah, that's crazy. Yeah. Too. Like, it was like 27 hours or 120 hours. Something like that. Yeah. And I always wonder why, you know, what is the thrill? I guess there's a thrill in, in going by yourself and seeing if you can make it. But without having... That kind of GPS or something. I don't SOS. do it because it's a thrill. I do it because it, it gets me in touch with my soul. <laughs> yeah. There's something uh, really, I don't know, the solitude of it and just being entirely responsible for your own tone, your own trip. I like taking trips with other people too. Don't get me wrong. Yeah. Um, but you know, you get up when you want to get up. You 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 get on the trail when you want to get on the trail. You don't have to wait or answer to anybody. And you're alone with your thoughts for really long stretches. And mm -hmm. it's amazing what creative ideas come to you while you're on the trail like that. And it helps you analyze your life and, you know, think about maybe the direction it's taking because you're away from all the things that normally make up your life. Right. And uh, it, it helps you see your own life from a different vantage point, mm -hmm. which is why I really like doing that. Like I've tried to do at least one solo trip a year, but since I moved back to Ontario, we've been so focused on, on building our house that I haven't really been doing that. But hopefully once we get set up, I'll go back to doing that again. The house is the adventure for now. You know, that's the priority. It's a pretty big adventure too. <laughs> it's yeah. so much work. Yeah. I spent oh a lot God. of time as a kid, um, not like walking in the woods by myself. And we have a park in Philadelphia. That's fairly big Fairmount Park. It runs through the city. Not like um, Central Park in New York, it kind of winds through. Central Park's like a rectangle. Um, and there's trails above the water and there's trails on the other side. And I would just walk, hike, walk, and then sit by myself. I just really loved it. Um, again, it's so peaceful. There's no stimulation. Mom's not yelling. Kids aren't asking me to do stuff. So I get that that part of, but I never actually thought about just going out and camping or hiking on my own for a period of time oh, it yeah, is so good. good and there's some things yeah. apart about it too that the the being alone uh, yeah. with, and camping alone and at night too that's some it can be a little unnerving i i admittedly when there's no one else around mm -hmm. um some of my trips are you know like i had no one camping nearby it's just me so sometimes it's like oh you're like every little noise you hear you're like what's that? <laughs> you know like <laughs> But then um, on some of these trails, like West Coast Trail, North Coast Trail, there's there's enough people around most of the time that, you know, like there's you at every stopping point, there's usually at least one other party, which is also kind of a fun adventure because you're all travelers on a similar journey. So you kind of exchange stories and it's it's a really fun way to make the trip better, like you, where you um, interact with our people who are having that same kind of adventure. Yeah. Although on the North Coast Trail. At the very last campsite, right at the end of the trail, where I was waiting for the water taxi to take me back to the mainland. Oh, I was sitting there really stewing because nobody was in that campsite. And when I arrived in that spot, we were ex I was expecting there to be a water source because it was marked in the map that there was water source at that site. But there wasn't any. And I'd finished my water. And the last place I could have gotten water was 10 kilometers back. Oh, boy. So it was like, okay, I had to evaluate, do I hike back and, and get the water? And then it was like, and it was already late in the, in the day, like close, it was evening or right. do I just, it's, I suck, I suck it up and then wait till the morning. And then I'm going to be getting back to my car. So you can survive a night without water. It's not, and it, not a pleasant experience. Plus my food, I needed water to hydrate the food. So I technically right. couldn't eat my dinner, <laughs> but um I uh, I sat there and there was also a lot of mosquitoes. It was the only place in this trail where there was a ton of mosquitoes. No other place, but this one spot, it was like tons of them. And I was sitting there getting eaten alive by bugs. And I I was just using a small bivy as my, mm -hmm. with a little tarp as my camping setup because I was trying to go ultra light. So for me to stay out of the bugs, I had to lie in my little bivy with the little net like I'm in a coffin it's just to sit there and and eventually I was like nuts to this I'm gonna go and sit on the water line and look at the coast and maybe meditate and maybe the bugs will leave me alone like they do in the zen stories right they did not leave me alone 
<laughs> but uh, a bear did come by because uh, he was walking lumbering along the coast and i was like wait a minute what's that and i see this large black bear you know looking for fish along the water side i was like so i just kind of stood up and took my hiking poles and started waving it's like hello mr bear i'm right here some extras don't pay me any mind but i'm just you know trying to make myself large and but may also not surprise it that's why i was talking and you know making it aware that i was there and Right. It didn't care about me. It just kept going. But uh, but it, it's pretty unsettling to run across a bear 20, you know, 20, 30 feet away when you're alone. Oh, yeah. even not alone. <laughs> oh, well, I mean, not alone. But at least if there's another person, you just need to run faster than the other person. Yeah, you just right? put them in, throw them in front, trip them. <laughs> <you know? laughs> Do you find that your dreams are different when you're alone up in the up in the hills with the stars and you haven't had all that? all that stimulation all day? Mm, I definitely dream. I, I sleep really soundly when I'm, when I'm doing those kinds of trips, like, mm -hmm. like amazing. Like I go to bed at eight and wake up at like six in the morning, like I wake up at dawn and I, you know, I, I, I don't know if I, my dreams are very different, but I dream pretty substantially even on a day-to-day -day basis. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Do you have a meditative practice? Generally. Yes, every morning I meditate. Uh, as I get up, I meditate for twenty minutes or so. Mm -hmm. What practice do you use? What what method? Of it's a very loose practice, to be honest. Mostly, I just kind of sit and you know notice my thoughts. And sometimes I use apps, you know, like you know that have like mindfulness you know, guides or um, loving kindness. You know, like mm -hmm. I'm open to trying different things when I'm you know like when I do my meditation, depending on my mood. Right. Right. Yeah, I'm just curious because it would seem that you would, given that you're going away for periods on your own to get in touch, you know, and kind of center in. Um, if I don't meditate in the morning, I don't feel like myself. Yeah. Do you feel like those moments in martial arts where you're you're engaging you know, with the opponent, like it once you get past the action and the movement, you're kind of in your own meditative space? Yeah, to so, yeah, I would say so to some degree. I mean, when the way I'm practicing these days, I'm trying to emphasize uh, flow and and kind of like keeping an open uh, open perspective of what's happening around me, as opposed to just saying I'm going to do this move. You know, it, yeah. I've re really modified the way I'm training and teaching, and it's uh, well, when I open my new dojo, it's I'm going to have my new dojo be it done uh, I'm mean, running it the a completely different way than I used to because I mm -hmm. want to emphasize that style of training more than what I used to do what would a class look like for that like I mean if you're, you're practicing basics or break falls and wrist locks and how would the how do you switch that emphasis is it by explaining a mind state that you want them to have or a feeling while they're training and that's where the focus would be well, I'm going in a very, very different direction from what I used to do because mm -hmm. I've been doing so much cross training when I was in Vancouver. Um, I, I did so many different other styles that I have started drawing in things that I learned from other arts and things that I like. And the things that I've really enjoyed are more on, in line with kind of live drills that uh, drills that have a liveness to them that allow you to kind of work on on timing and structure, but it's less prescriptive than my style. Typically it's a, you know, taught in a way that's more prescriptive. Like somebody grabs you like this and you defend yourself like this. Um, it's an, if this, then that kind of approach. And if you do enough memorized techniques, eventually you get the principles too. And you can teach the principles within that content framework of prescribed techniques for sure. But I, Kind of grown weary of the belt system and teaching to the idea of okay you're gonna get your yellow belt you gotta memorize these this 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 and this and then have that be the primary focus and motivation for students I kind of feel like it and it brings on a mentality that it's more about you know getting to the next level than it is about loving the art that you're learning right and I know it's not a very popular um approach uh to go to completely basically i'm not going to have a belt system anymore um i'm just going to teach principles that um that are apply applicable in a wide variety of ways and that students can should learn them in a way that makes sense for their bodies and their sizes and their different um 
you know, different skills and limitations because we all have different uh, things that we can and can't do. And if when you focus on prescribed techniques, then you are limiting it to what people are able to do of those techniques. And, and some of them are not going to be relevant for other for people. So I, I want people to use what I, th I teach to explore what they're capable of doing. Um, so now when you say, how is that going to look like in a class? I'm, I'm working on that. I've been uh, running, like, since I moved to Ottawa, I've been running martial arts study groups with a number of like-minded old black belt friends that live in the area mm -hmm. to play test some concepts and then put them into the context of what I want to be teaching in my dojo. But more, uh, I'd like to have, um, uh, I like to say the focus of the class to be martial arts only. So like, I'm not going to be doing fitnessy stuff. Like people can do, take care of their own fitness. I don't want to, I want to have the a tight one hour where what we're all doing is martial arts based right. stuff. And the warm up is martial arts. It's like, I'm not wasting any time. Mm -hmm. Um, So I'm using, a, I've been using a, some drills that are very similar to, well, pretty much exactly the same as Hubid Lubid. Uh, yeah. uh, like the, Filipino martial arts drills where you're doing blocks and, and strikes back and forth. And what I really like about that as a way of training different things is that it's kind of like skipping, you know, like skipping rope. Yeah. Uh, so like when kids play and they each have like an end of the rope and they're skipping, they keep the rope going and going. And then it's up to you to know when to jump in. Nobody just does one, one turn and then you walk in. Right. You have to keep it going and, and say, and when you figure out the timing, that's when you jump in. Right. Uh, so I feel like that drill allows people to, you keep go doing the drill. And then when you, you want to interrupt it, you have to figure out that timing. When's the exact right time to do it. And if you miss it, you miss it, but then you just wait, you let it, you keep the drill going until you find that timing again. Mm -hmm. And it also allows students to have a lot more repetitions than if you just do, okay, I'm going to do it once you're going to do it once. I'm going to do it once. It's like you get yeah. so many more reps in and people get much better, much quicker when you have an exercise like that. Mm -hmm. So that's, and it's not just that one drill, drill from Filipino martial arts. I've also been kind of working on kind of pressure referencing drills that are very similar to sticky hands that I've kind of been blending sticky hands and pushing hands and fencing concepts um, so that people are kind of, getting used to the idea of keeping pressure to maintain contact so that you have that one, that reference point with which to enter into techniques. Um, so that's another form of drill that I've been kind of incorporating into it. So like I've really emphasized a lot of um, introduction of the trapping range. So no, uh, like we, yes, we have lots of striking too. We have, we're grappling, but that trapping range is, I feel like in jujitsu has largely been ignored that area where you've made contact but you haven't established a grip right. um it's such an important place to navigate because you can get into so many things from that place without um you know like if you are aware of what you have um anyway so um, long story short i'm kind of um i'm using these drills as a way of helping people have more awareness on timing and structure and um, principles that are universal in the martial arts. And then um, using it to kind of enter into locks and takedowns and various other things that are in my, you know, my training background. Um, but I'm also getting away from, you know, grabbing on to do takedowns like heavily, like I'm trying to go in for lighter, like you know, if you're doing it from a striking, from that striking drill, from Hubud Lubud, you know, like you, once you have contact, you're moving in, keeping the contact, using the contact to break the balance. And then before they know it, you're, you're, you're skipping in and you've hooked a foot and because they're off balance, they're just kind of naturally tripping or falling um, as opposed to going in and grabbing hard. And then as soon as you grab on hard, it causes people to react defensively. But if you don't, if you kind of get in there, break their balance before they even realize it's broken and then go for the takedown, it's a much more effective way to do it, especially if you're my size. If you screw up a, a takedown when you're small and you're grabbed on, then you're in a much worse place because they can counter it on you. And being a, if they're a bigger person, it's much easier for them to, to, take advantage of their size and that kind of uh, grip. Mm -hmm. 
I like the jump rope analogy. I hadn't heard that before, so I'm going to steal it. Oh, please do. I came up with that recently and I was like, oh, that's gold. I got to write that down. Because then I think like in the 80s, we had the, the double Dutch uh, jump rope. So oh, that's even hard. better. That's way right? harder. I because don't know that's if I ever like really the mastered two hands, that. Right? It's not, it, not just one hand. It's like two yeah. hands moving differently. And then you've mm -hmm. got to navigate two ropes up, down, huh. you know, and then you got all your steps change, right? Yes. So it's like all your moves can change. You know, funny you should mention that I was just doing this, some pressure referencing drills with my students the other day. And like we've been doing it where we're one on the inside and outside of the arms where we go going like this, pressuring yeah. on their arms, one, two, three, and circle. One, uh, two, three, and that's circle. double dutch, see? <laughs> yeah, but no, that's not double dutch because it's all going the same direction. Because right, right. yesterday or Wednesday when I did it, I said, okay, let's try this. One arm is up, one is down, <laughs> and you're going one, two, three. Oh, one, there you go. Two, three. So, but you're going in two different di energetic directions. And yeah. in one side, you're the aggressor. And one side, you're the defender. You have to give to one oh. side and push to the other. And boy, does that ever mess your brain up. And that's more like the double Dutch. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's pretty cool. Yeah. We, yeah, we it didn't even messed my brain up because like, I was like, oh, Jesus, how does this work again? Because <laughs> it's my own like, idea. Your head and rub your stomach it's, or, it's exactly you know. Like that. <laughs> If you, um, wait, what is it? There's one of those things with the fingers I can't do. Uh, let me figure it out. Like if you do one, one way, one, the other way, and then face them together, I can't keep it. Like they end up both going the same way. It, it's like this weird coordination wow. thing. But you I think know. ultimately the, my goal with the, in teaching, is I'm going to be running my dojo in my basement at this because we're building our house and we're building a basement that's big enough that we have a small martial arts class um and it, it we're no longer going to be you know dependent on the lease or anything like that we can be pandemic proof recession proof and uh and i can just teach the way i want to like this thing with the belt system is it, it's a really great way to keep people motivated that yeah. you know it, it, it people who might not otherwise be motivated yeah. and because of the way I want to teach, I only want people who are really fundamentally in love with what I'm doing to yeah. and like, and I want them to do it because they love it, not because they're going to get a belt in two months, you know? <laughs> so um, the goal is to make it playful and fun and that, you know, like it's not about, you know, being super rigid and dogmatic and, uh, and like, you know, if you don't do it this way, you got to do push-ups or, you know, right. like I'm just so done with the rigidity because people learn better when they're having fun and laughing and smiling mm -hmm. and like it doesn't have to be a serious environment all the time and like we get in, we have so much seriousness in our lives nowadays even more than ever before let's like let's make this a, a safe environment for us to play and have a nice community that we meet with and what once or twice a week and then um and do something that keeps us healthy and our brains active and uh and then keeps us motivated to do it for a really long time yeah. Are you going to use uh, geese uniforms or? Um, I'm going to, I'll probably offer t-shirts if they want them. Um, right. And, you know, every so often, if we do something where a gi would be useful, like a gripping a thing, then I might just say, if you've got like a bathrobe or something, bring it in, or I'll have some old geese that I can yeah. just kind of give people just so they have them. Cause I have a few mm. kicking around, yeah. but like, I don't want it to, I want it to be a little more informal. Um yeah. And so I'm going to move away from geese for regular training and then kind of, of course, I'll use them for formal events still. I mean, because I, I still teach at um, conferences and stuff like that. And and uh, it does have its place. And if I brought students to an event, I would probably put a belt on them just yeah. so people understand where they are in the hierarchy of so that they know how to treat them as a yeah. student. Right. And a lot of the that's, the, that's the one thing that is uh, really helpful though for the belt system is when you go to an event where people from different styles are there and they just they understand better what your level is i think that that is useful mm -hmm. it's useful for the students too to see you know what their level is next to somebody they might be watching over here or practicing with you know in a little seminar section mm -hmm. you know, that person's getting it better than me how come well they're a brown belt and you're like a yellow belt in equivalency and uh, I think that's a good idea in those kind of merged events, okay. you know. Well, that doesn't always necessarily mean that the <laughs> yeah. that the quality is the, yeah. but at least it's a general indicator. Yeah. yeah, yeah. We find that most of the Filipino martial art masters I trained with 
there was no uniform, no belts, no that. You just practice and you just do it. I know. And you're either good or you're not. And the people around you call you master or whatever, you know, or teacher, you know. And um, but now there's a lot of Filipino guys. There's groups that do belts and uniforms and and everything else. And it's just like, what are you doing? <laughs> the art was so free, and now and now it's getting locked up. You know. Well, you know what? I love Filipino martial arts, and since I started training, it's had a very heavy influence on what mm -hmm. I'm doing with my jujitsu. And and I really like the the um the the way it's like taught in backyards and you know and right. basements and stuff. But I understand if somebody wants to make you know, living doing it, it's really hard to do it that way. It's super hard. Yeah. Uh, and, you know, and if people are trying to like kind of move their style forward and, you know, get it out there, it's also hard, you know, it's because mm -hmm. like, that's one of the things that's made the downfalls of Filipino martial arts is it's, it's so fragmented and, um, and because it's done in a very kind of oral tradition where people just to teach who they know, and, you know, it's, it's made it hard to um, kind of keep a style moving forward or going you know but is that bad i don't know if that's necessarily bad but uh, if that's what the goal is right. um it would be harder that way yeah you're right you said goal i think it's the goal is the goal of the teacher to keep the art alive and going past their time here or is the goal just to perpetuate the art and it's like you know painting and anything else that it's you know here's your skills and you do it your way. But if you're trying to have, you know, students in a hierarchy in schools, you got to have a structure. It yeah. I mean, so loose. So it makes sense. Um, I have nothing against it. And, you yeah. know, like I'm just doing this because this is the way I want to teach. And, um, yeah. you know, like I, I don't have anything against the other ways of doing it. But um, because of the type of training I want to offer, I, I just think it, that this kind of environment will be more conducive to what I want to offer. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Chinese have been doing that that way for a long time too. kind of more mm -hmm. open class. I mean, the, the colored belts and all came in, you know, in the last 30 years. I mean, they were never there. So they just had sashes, which were their belt, you know, their actual belt to hold up their clothes. Uh, so there was, you know, th classes, three hours, come when you want, go when you want, a little more loose, you know, but um, it was taught you know, just taught kind of that way. Everybody has different teaching and it seems like every generation we're trying to figure out how to teach, but it's like thousands of years people have been still trying to figure out how to teach. It's uh, martial arts, it's crazy. Well, I am now kind of just doing it because this is something I love and I want to share my yeah. love with other people. And if people like what I have to offer, they're more than welcome to come join me uh, no matter what their backgrounds are. I feel like what I, the way I'm teaching is much more adaptable for a wider variety of people. Yeah, it's more approachable. It's more welcoming. Um, and I think that um, the reason for teaching uh, for many people, but especially for me, and I, and that's the only person I can really speak to, is <laughs> that I want to just do something positive for and um, you know with this with my passion. And uh, I've decided that I'm no never going to teach in a way that's. I'm required to make money off of it right. ever again. I'm just, I don't, cause it, it really tanked my desire to be involved in the martial arts. Like after, after doing it for money for so long and, and I'm like, I wasn't even making it, doing it for like a living. I was just need, needing enough money to make rent for the dojo. That's it. Um, but even that was hard. Um, anyway, I just, I, I would rather make money other ways. And then just teach how I want to teach. It doesn't matter if I have a million students. I could just, I can have five students and that's totally fine. Yeah, it's your passion, you know? Mm -hmm. And when passion becomes a job, it, all the goals shift. You have yeah. to do rent and overhead and have clean mats and the bathrooms need to be clean and you got to do marketing. And it's like, wait, I'm not doing oh, The mats need to be clean regardless. <laughs> regardless. <laughs> they still need to be clean. Oh, right? Leave them dirty. People, and I've seen a lot of, corporate stuff or like business dojos where they don't clean the mats it's like exactly. it's so gross in why the do 80s, people do that in the 80s a lot of karate and taekwondo schools at least here in philadelphia they had carpeting and everybody's bare feet and sweating and you would go in sometimes and it was so bad that you're oh. just like let's get some of that carpet fresh you know and a vacuum and then a steam cleaner once in a while, I mean, it would it would just be, and you'd think, who's getting bacteria sharing here? You know, 
Oh, yeah. So you wrote a book, a book on jujitsu. Oh yeah, the, that one. Uh, it's been a while. That was like t- 2012. My uh, when the fight goes to the ground. Yeah. Mm-hmm. How did that come about? How did you decide to get the the idea or the passion or the inkling to want to do a book? Well, I, you know, it, it came to me through my blog. Um, somebody from Tuttle Publishing approached me and mm-hmm. asked me if I was in if I had any book ideas that I was interested in pitching, and I did, <laughs> but yeah. I, you know, I wasn't actively looking for it. Um, they just liked my style of writing from my blog and thought that I could offer something great. And so they had this new format where there was like going to be instructional stuff in the book as well as a video that accompanied it. Mm-hmm. And so you know, we took care of doing all that. We did all the the photos and all the right, and I did the writing and then the videos and it was a it was a lot of work. Yeah, I I don't I, I'm glad we did it the once because I you know I, I one of the goals I had in my life was that I wanted to be a published author and I got that with that and if somebody asked me to do it like somebody asked me if I because I really like cooking right and people yes. are saying you should do a recipe book I'm like hell no <laughs> I've already done one book where you have to do all the photos and all the it's so much work oh and I do cooking for passion and that's it i don't like i don't want to monetize on it because the amount of work that's required to make it a book i'm like i the only reason why i put it on my blog that's because i just want to share it and that's it right right. i'm already sharing it i don't need to have a book to share my recipes because i got a blog as soon as i like a recipe i can put it right up (laughs) and i always see like oh here's this new wild blueberry and, and something something i've just made and it's vegan and i'm like Oh, you didn't send me one. You know? <laughs> Every you've always got these amazing things that they look just amazing. Are you a vegan now? Or no, no, I'm not vegan. I, I I'm I do low carb most of the time, and uh, and you know I do some of them are are vegan recipes, but uh, yeah. I'm not vegan. And I was just gonna say you have to have that big steak again when you're hiking and you get hungry. <laughs> yeah. No, I'm 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 totally down with the meats. <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, and I see you like to have a lot of fun. I think I saw one one thing on you. I, this all goes back years. So I don't even know when. You may not even remember it, but you're like playing Nerf guns or something, and with and in the house. Oh, that was a like a, a little short film that my husband and I did. Oh, okay. Yeah, that was fun. It was just it, it was something he was getting into stunts at the time. It's like let's little put together a fun short film, film yeah. it in our house, and then. And then it's a good way to kind of practice some stunt reactions and and fight mm-hmm. skills and stuff like that. That that was a little bit of fun. Yeah. Um, so tell me about when you got interested or started doing um, like the ice bathing. Is oh that was ooh, cold water work is something I got introduced to through film because okay. my free diving instructor in Vancouver, Roberta Senedes, she is uh, also a cold water swimmer. Mm. And during the pandemic and like we, she actually before the pandemic she was and and since the pandemic she does these cold water um training courses for mm-hmm. performers and so that was my first introduction to it was through her course she taught us how to do breath holds for it was first stunts and cold water stuff mm. and um that got me interested more in it and uh, i did a little extra training with her doing like underwater like monofin work uh, which came in handy for the um, work that I did on siren okay Um, but her and I you know you know we were always close because she was like always working on siren with me as as one of the dive safety Mm. Um, and then during the pandemic she started a you know in in, in, in a little cold water swimming group that um you know it was one thing we could all go out and do cold, go swimming in the ocean that was kind of pandemic safe you know like yeah you know, so we would meet up and like you know it's spring like early may april and uh go into the water when it was like five celsius and mm-hmm. go for a swim <laughs> yeah i saw you i don't know a couple weeks ago and there was looks like you just cut out a hole in some ice in a frozen oh, I didn't cut the hole um oh that was in but that was here in Ottawa so okay. I never back in Vancouver I'd done a lot of cold water immersions and swims but there was never any ice stuff because you know okay. where we lived there wasn't really ice but um in Ottawa I was out for a walk on at Britannia Beach which is on the Ottawa River and I saw that they had a whole like uh, a whole thing cut into the ice where they had like a little 
cut, cut in holes and then a little swimming lane. And this was in like January, February. I'm like, what? This exists in Ottawa? People do this? I'm like, that's cool. I was like, I'm going to try it. Um, and I hadn't, at this point, it's, I'd been in Ottawa for like eight months, uh, or sorry, I'd been in Ottawa since the last summer. And I hadn't done any cold water training since like May the, the year before. But I was like, oh, well, you know what? It's, I'm going to give it a shot. And so I kind of got in my head, I'm going to make a plan. I'm going to go and get myself into the ice and then do, you know, an immersion for, well, up to my neck for a few minutes and give that a shot. And then, and I had a, a safety person, you know, plan to be there with me because getting in and out of the water um, often leaves you with um, motor dysfunctions and stuff. It's mm-hmm. good to have somebody there to help you get in and out of your clothes or get out of into your clothes afterwards when you come out. But uh, I was not, um, I was not able, like, I was starting to have a little bit of anxiety leading up to it because I'm like, oh my God, it's ice. Is it, it like, I've only ever done like the lowest was like, you know, a, a water temperature of two Celsius. Um, and it was only a jump in for work. Like, so I was like in and out and then in a hot, you know, in a warming tub right after. Yeah. Um, so I, I started, you know, I was doing cold water showers for, preparation and to help me get mentally prepared for what that was going to be like and you know it's not the same but it's better than nothing yeah and then I also gave myself an out and like if the weather is not good like if it's super windy or way too cold in mm-hmm. the air temperatures I'll just wait for a, a warmer day because I want it to be a nice sunny day that's not windy and you know where the air temperature is closer to zero and not to, like really cold and so as the day was approaching I'm like Oh, well, if it, I don't know if the weather is going to be right. And it's like, <laughs> yeah. like, but then it was perfect weather. It was exactly what I wanted it to be. So I'm like, well, I guess I don't have an excuse not to do it. <laughs> so I went out there and met my friend to, and uh, went to the water. And like you, yeah, as a part of it, you walk around to warm up your body, you like get your core temperature up before you do it. And uh, yeah, I basically did it did my little walk around for an hour and then when I got to the water I just right let's just do it take off the clothes and just get in the water and I, I kept gloves and water socks on um as well as a hat because it was my first time and I wanted to have the keeping the extremities a bit warmer or uh, makes it a little bit better but once I got in up to my neck and I I settled in I was like it felt amazing uh I didn't feel cold like I know because I had the mental preparation done to it. Like I know how to do the breath work to, to stay calm. So a lot of people, when they first get in, they hyperventilate and they feel burning pain on their skin mm-hmm. uh, in a way that uh, makes them want to get out. And that's your body basically saying, you're going to die, get out of the water. <laughs> um, but your body is capable of doing a lot more than you think, but you kind of have to convince your brain of that before you can do those things. Right, right. But because I already accepted that I was able to do this and I have a lot of experience doing it and I know how to kind of keep my mind calm, I was able to get in. I gave myself the plan. I was going to do aim for three minutes or sorry, aim for one minute minimum. But if I was feeling good about it, I was going to go for three minutes. Okay. Uh, and like uh, once I got in, I'm like, okay, actually felt feel really good it felt very calm and very it was very zen like I just felt like the world was a beautiful place and uh and I stayed in the full three minutes and I forced myself to get I could have stayed longer I felt pretty good but when you it's a good idea to stick to the limitations you set here for yourself because and not over push because uh, that's when thing, bad things happen. So I, once it was three minutes, I got out and I did my routine of immediately getting my, my warm clothes on and walking back to the car. So they get a little bit of, you know, exercise to rewarm your body. Mm-hmm. Um, and yeah, was, after that, I fell in love with it. And I was going every week until the end of the winter. And it was just amazing and when I move out to Burnstown where our new house is going to be we live on our we'll be living on a river I plan to be able to do this every day from my uh, from from the river where we live it'll be great oh that'll be cool are you familiar with Wim Hof 
the ice I am. Um, we're, that's not what I practice. Um, my instructor is actually, um, she is from ADA, the International Dive, uh, it's like a free diving association. Mm -hmm. And they're actually against the Wim Hof method. Oh, okay. Um, she has uh, um, advised us that a lot of the kinds of uh, breath work that they use, like with the hyperventilation, that if you were going to use it for free diving, it can leave you um, with an over-exaggerated um, idea of what your, your uh, boundary lines are. Um, so it can be dangerous to do that. Now, if you're just doing hyperventilation and then not immersing and not doing yeah. it for like, then maybe exactly. like it's not a big a deal, but, um, because of the free diving, um, connection I have, I yeah. don't practice it that way. And I don't want to get in the habit of practicing it that way because when I do it for work, uh, where I, if I'm doing breath holds and stuff for work, and that was something I did start to incorporate into my ice work was I started doing breath holds in it too. Um, I don't want to accidentally go beyond what I'm capable of. Yeah. Well, the, the, the reason you're doing it is different and the goal is different. So exactly. it makes um, yeah. sense that there would be a different method, you know, mm -hmm. uh, to it. Now, why do breath holds make you feel um, warmer or what do they do for you? while you're in the cold water or is it because you're needing to dive so you're doing a breath hold oh yeah the breath holds are not related to the cold water oh, if, okay. I mean, if you're doing hypoxia training then you're kind of getting a double dip where you're doing cold water exposure as well as how to um breath hold it you know, mm -hmm. which is another form of natural stress um but they're not necessarily connected okay. what, would yeah. you be able to share with our listeners something about the breathing method that helps you withstand that cold when you or go in Oh yeah, sure. It's just yeah. relaxation breathing. I mean, every my instructor kind of advised you know people to use the kind the breath, you know, the breathing methods that help you to relax personally because there's lots of different ways to do it. Um, there's box breathing where you know in for four, hold for four, out for four. Um, I like to do kind of the in for four, hold for seven, out for eight. Then um, mm -hmm. that's my I like having the out out breath longer than the in in breaths but uh whatever feels good for you is is what's going to work best so f if i'm understanding is it physiologically when your body is more relaxed it helps you adapt to the temperature change is that the key? Okay. yeah that's it yeah. because um if your re if your cortisol levels are high it's going to react to the stress like more acutely so mm -hmm. So being calm allows you to keep more control over your bodily's reactions to the stress. Okay. So I can see why the Wim Hof's method is not appropriate for that because it's the opposite. It's all that hyperventilating is creating a stress response, I would think, in his method. Well, actually, the with hyperventilation, it actually, you're basically loading a bunch of oxygen into your body and it helps you to hold your breath longer. Mm -hmm. That's it. Like it, it does work. Like I'm not saying that... You, you can, most people will hold their breath longer when they hyperventilate, but it's not about the, uh, I don't know about. No, I was just thinking about tolerance to the you cold. Know. I, you know. I, I couldn't speak to that because I didn't, I didn't study the Wim Hof yeah. method. So um, I hesitate to make any claims one way or the other. <laughs> yeah. But it sounds like, that sounds pretty cool. I'm going to try it. I filled my bathtub with just all cold water. So I don't mm -hmm. know how cold it was. It was pretty cold though, but it wasn't it'll ice. It'll be cold and it'll be reasonably cold. Like, yeah. uh, especially as you get the winter hits because mm -hmm. the cold water becomes colder as our winter. Like I remember when I was taking showers here in the it, with full on cold in the winter, I'm like, it felt cold, much colder than it did when I was in Vancouver doing a so cold shower. Yeah. You've got free diving and cold water and book writing and cooking and nature and hiking and martial arts. What else? What else? I, there's got to be more, not that you need more, to Lori that we don't know yeah. about. Well, right now, um, I think I, I'm a little yeah. bit more pedestrian than I have been in the last while because we are focusing on building the house. Now, that is a, its own challenge. Like, Because right now, we're just, we've are just we been in a writer's strike, an actor's strike right. for, in the film industry since May. The writer's strike is about to end, or it's, it's ended, but the actor's strike is still going on. So we literally have not been working since May. Um, so, and... You know, we've been we had this uh, house that we've been building and, uh, you know, and no income. So we'd always planned to do a lot of the work ourselves, especially with the interior finishing. But the not working has necessitated that we do a lot more of the work than we necessarily wanted to, to do. <laughs> um, but that's OK. You know, like, you know, it gives us uh, a way to save money. And and in a lot of ways, when you build your own house, you love it more, even if it's not perfect. 
Um, right. I think that's true of a lot of things, like the more effort and like that you put into, you know, learning something, doing something, making something at the end, when, with, when you have whatever result it is, you're going to naturally be biased to like it better. And this is the house we're going to live in for the rest of our lives, theoretically. So what a great investment, I think. I, I started uh, when I was during the pandemic, I got my life, I got life coaching certification. Oh. Um, so I started doing life coaching. <laughs> <laughs> Well, you know what? I think with all your background, you have a really good pull of information and experience for that. A lot yeah. of people do it and they're just like, I can't get a job. I'll be a life coach. Tell other people how to do it. Follow a prescription and, you know, I hope it works for them. But you've done so many, like you're building a house, you ran a business, you got into stunts, you know, you like, you have all this experience to draw from. I and uh, when we get into our house, we're going to run an Airbnb business. Um, we're running it like a nature retreat. So oh, cool. um, it's going to be called Leaf on the Wind Nature Retreat. Uh, um, and I want to run it in this way that is encouraging people to come and use it as a time for personal reflection, like taking a personal retreat mm -hmm. or a couple of retreat where they you're where you're actually there to get away from your life and kind of refocus your energy and decide what's important to you. And then that way, that's why I got the life coaching certification because. Uh. I thought that it would marry well into that. And then if people wanted a little extra, like some experience part added experience where they, you know, they're working through a stuck point and uh, they can hire me as a coach, you know, for a session while they're, while they're staying there to kind of work through it. Well, think about bonding experiences. If you take a couple out canoeing, swimming, hiking, you or know, I, you know, ice, icing, uh, icing people diving. really, really, really want to do it. Yeah. I mean, that's a good, you know, trust. You can develop trust things there and bonding and relying on each other when if they've got some issues in their relationship. I mean, I see so many, so much potential there for you. And Do there's you a, like, it's a really good area for outdoorsy stuff. There's tons of hikes and there's mm -hmm. ice climbing, there's kayaking, there's, you know, we are on a river. So people, we have like boats that people can take out if they want, you know, it's, it's, it's such a beautiful area. I, I just can't wait to move there. Really? I wish I oh, had I guess open stunts. up. I mean, I guess stunts is a thing, but we didn't really talk as much about stunts. Time, that, uh, have but you, have you done like free fall stunts where you're up for flying off a building into a, into a, uh, Chris or, did, uh, he did a 35 foot uh, high fall, uh, into an airbag. I've never done one for work, but I did a lot of, like, I did a wire work explosion, um, for the stand. Um, that was pretty cool. I did a full body burn. What else? Uh, uh oh, the with my free diving, uh, we had to do that thing for it was a Netflix series called Breathe. And because they wanted to do the shot out in nature and not in the tank, uh, we went to like a glacier fed lake in Whistler oh. and they sank me down for the thing. I had to start at the top, take a big, big breath, and then they my um my dive safety people sank me down to my first mark where I would start my action. My character in it was swimming from the bottom of a lake for, uh, after a helicopter crash to get back to the earth to the surface or as a plane crash. Sorry. And so they sank me down to my first mark and this is cold water. Like it was five Celsius. And uh, I mean, had they had a wetsuit for me, but it's still cold. Mm -hmm. uh, and, but I also had like wig. I had like I boots clothes coat sweater jeans that's so, hard to swim in that let alone yes, be, it, deep, a lot deep, more yeah. challenging than <laughs> and then also the cold water and then because I was wearing a wetsuit under my clothes too when once I got to my first mark they were supposed to tap me and then let me know okay that's to take to, to start the swim up um and then I I was sitting there at my holding on to the weight belt that was supposed to keep me sit down um, and I didn't get the tap and I've already been, you know, holding my breath for 25 seconds to get sunk down to that position. I'm like, I wonder when I'm going to get the tap. And then I'm like, and then I kind of realized, I don't think they, I think they already tapped me because yeah. I, um, they, because they were there when they tapped me, they're supposed to let me go. And then I was supposed to drop the weight belt and swim. But, and I started, I was sinking unknowingly because I can't see, I don't have goggles, of course. And I, I'm sinking, there's no frame of reference. And then I, the only frame of reference I had was when I started to get an ear squeeze because I was sinking and without equalizing, I was like, oh shit, they did tap me. So I dropped the weight belt and I just started swimming. And for this scene, they didn't want me to look like an experienced swimmer. So instead of doing a really relaxed, you know, breaststroke with a frog kick, I was doing a breaststroke, but with a flutter kick, which is very inefficient for as a yeah. swim. 
and they wanted me to look kind of desperate. Mm -hmm. But as I start for my swim, and I don't, they don't want me swimming straight up. They want me swimming on a diagonal because the camera is down here. And then they want the shot to look like I'm swimming for a long distance. Right. As I'm swimming up, I look at the surfaces. I'm like, holy crap, the surface is really far. <laughs> but at the, because I had sunk further than I was supposed to be. And I actually swam up into camera. Like I was coming from below camera at this point. Uh, and I, I was swimming, swimming. And then I was like, am I going to make it? I'm going to make it. And the safety was if I wasn't going to make it for whatever reason, I would just go straight up and, and or I'd, I'd flag the safety divers for, for assistance. But, but we'd had so many challenges that day with different, with conditions and you know, that we were, we were really struggling to get a good shot in the can. And I didn't want to be the reason why we didn't get that shot. So I just, just, I just suck it up, do it, do it, do it. And I just kept going, going, going. And then I got to the surface and like, oh, I was so relieved. <laughs> I, I I have the shot the footage from it. I put it up on my Instagram, but it didn't, they didn't end up using it in the final After edit of the movie because it didn't match. They did other footage in a tank with the actress. Uh, and the, the, the look didn't match. So there's no way they could have used it. So well, good but it was like one of the most <laughs> epic stunts I'd ever done. It yeah. was such a good stunt and it was really tough, like mentally challenging because, uh, you know, like there's so many variables when you're in natural water source than when you're in a tank where it's very controlled. Mm -hmm. um, but it's a really good memory because I really, uh, I, I, I'll never forget that. Can you put it on your reel? I mean, you know, your stunt reel. Uh, it, I don't. See, without all that context of, right. you know, of that I just told you just, about, oh, it doesn't really look like anything. So <laughs> when I put it on Instagram, I, I gave all the information in the context. Yeah. But like, if you look at it, it just looks like a person swimming. It's not right. exciting. <laughs> <laughs> so like, even though it like is a very challenging stunt and people in the industry would recognize what it takes to do that scene. Yeah. Like, it's not something like that's... I don't know it's not exciting to put on a stunt reel to you know, like and I have another scene that actually looks a little better th of me swimming I don't know maybe I'll sw switch it in I don't know I'll, I'll think about it <laughs> <laughs> you have to have commentary rolling up with it you know she almost died didn't make it she went too far no no I did not <laughs> almost day. die I was not even close to that <laughs> it was just a very challenging a very challenging stunt though yeah. um I'm glad I did it though. It was definitely like one of the most epic stunts of my career. Is there a stunt that people do in the industry that you feel like, yeah, I'm just, that's just past what I'm willing to do. Not at the moment. Um, I don't know any, there's, they've got new ways of doing things that they used to, that they used to do in more dangerous ways Yeah. that like, it's, it's much safer than the industry used to be like, 30 years ago yeah. so honestly I can't think of something that I would say no to right now um because like I mean for the most part things that like high falls fire burns um even car hits like I did a car hit um but it was still like more like a simulated car hit because like I was riding the front of the hood of the car and then when they called the action I I let go and jumped up and flipped and flipped my back to hit the windshield and then fell off the car as it drove away so mm. it looks like a car hit because they do different camera angles. Right. Um, but honestly, it would depend. I mean, maybe there's some sort of types of, if they want to do a wire gag in a certain way that caused a lot more whiplash, maybe I might would, would think twice about it. But there's, depends on the wire, the riggers, because riggers are not all equal. And some people can do it in a way that looks great and is safe. And, you know, like, and everyone comes back, you know, comfortably like with no injuries or anything and there's other ways that rig that people are much more likely to get injured so yeah. i mean i would it's just a take it as it you know take each one each case for what it is and then analyze it from my own what my body wants to do and and you know my confidence in the coordinator to make it safe is there a stunt you haven't done that you're just dying to do that you'd really like to do uh, i wouldn't mind doing a high fall but they don't really do high falls that often anymore so I, I don't know that I would necessarily get that opportunity yeah um I wouldn't mind doing more extensive fighting uh I mean I have done fighting but like mm -hmm. would I wouldn't mind a role where the we I got to do a lot more complex uh, complex um, choreography uh, than I've done so far in my career mm -hmm. you know those kinds of opportunities they're not like they don't come like there's a lot of competition for those kinds of things and I haven't always had the 
the opportunity, but um, I mean, I've done some, like I said, right. There's nothing on my list where I'd say, you know, oh, you know, there is one thing I would really like to do. I'd like to get on a Star Trek. Yes. <laughs> two Star Trek shows shooting in Toronto, and I'm a huge Star Trek fan. I don't care what the stunt is. I right, just, just want to be on a Star Trek. Right. That then I can then I can say oh, I'm happy with my career. I can right. leave saying, yes, I did everything. I did my Star Trek. Yeah. I bet you get on this year, 23. <laughs> Not well, even there's still work. like discovery and then there's nothing and, happening and new worlds both shoot in toronto yeah. so uh, you know if i could somehow manage to get on one of those i'm like i would love that yeah. i yeah. saw one you were doing something with um Ristita de jesus but years ago oh yeah. yes yes sure she's the one was. that got me into going to the women's martial arts um events like pama Oh, okay. uh, and, and National Women's Martial Arts Federation. Like she invited me. She's like, you'd be a really good person to teach at one of these. And I'm like, boy, well, those were really great events. Oh, you met Kathy Long, right? Oh, yeah. That yeah. was a that was an amazing experience because like Catwoman was the thing that made me really want to get into like she uh, get into the martial arts. Mm -hmm. Like, uh, And she was the stunt double for Catwoman. She was, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and I didn't know who she was at the time. Her oh, really? and I were chit-chatting because she's like, she's Ristita's partner. And then uh, as we were chit chatting, I'm like, she, I, she's like in LA. And I was like, oh, did you ever get into in, in, do any film work? Because <laughs> I didn't know. And she's like, oh, I've done some. She's some. so humble. I and I was like, oh, them. anything I would know? And she's like, well, you know, I, I, one of my most no better known ones was Catwoman on Batman Returns. I'm like, what you are literally a reason why i got into the martial arts it was like meeting my idol and she was just awesome That's like so i didn't cool. even and i didn't even know it like i had no idea Indeed. and thank you so much for your time i really appreciate it it was great getting to know you a bit yeah great getting to know you too thank you so much for inviting me yeah thanks. welcome to the transformations podcast here guests and i will share our transformative experiences and we'll explore how to find excellence in life